Now the Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. In 1843, a Dr. James Braid of Manchester developed the art of being able to produce trance sleep. Of course, he was not the first. That honor belonged to Friedrich Anton Mesmer. But Dr. Braid did coin the name of this both beneficial yet potentially disastrous parascience, hypnotism. In the skilled hands of a doctor or a psychiatrist, it can be profoundly beneficial. But in the hands of an amateur or someone unscrupulous, it can be murderously dangerous. That's it, Marge. Just keep your eyes on the coin as it goes back and forth, back and forth. You're getting sleepy, so sleepy. Your eyelids are heavy. You can't hold them up. You've got to sleep, sleep. Sleep. She... She's under, Mark. They're putting me on, Jeff. She's fake. No, no, she's under, all right. She's a hypnotist dream. Very suggestible. Look, I'll prove it to you. What's this? Hey, don't hold it there. Just long enough to show she doesn't react. You could have burned her. <laughs> oh, come on. You think I'd do anything to hurt your sister? Well, now that you've got her under, what are you going to do? What would you like her to do? Jeff asked me, what would you like her to do? Well, I would have liked her to murder my father. <laughs> I wondered how Jeff would have reacted if I'd said that out loud. It almost came out anyway, since it's all I think of these days. How to murder, destroy, wipe out my father. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Murder with Malice, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Marsha Rod and Ira Lewis. It is sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When you feel like having a cold Budweiser, do you automatically reach for a glass? Well, sure, Bud's a great beer any way you drink it. But without a glass, you're really missing something. Now, take that wonderful Budweiser head of foam, for instance. Those bubbles, tiny though they are, still amount to something pretty special at the top of your glass. Taste appeal and eye appeal. Two results of exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation. It takes a lot longer to brew Budweiser that way. But brewing beer right does make a difference that you can taste. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've really said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. <laughs> North Jersey is certainly getting a higher yield this season, especially with Suburban Savings Special High Yield Savings Certificate that you can raise for fun and profit. All you have to do is plant a modest $2,500 minimum in Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. Then put your certificate in a nice safe place. Suburban takes care of the rest by compounding interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. You'll get a nice healthy 7.90% effective annual yield on your 7.50% savings certificate when you let it grow from four to ten years. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is, of course, subject to a substantial penalty. So for a nice, healthy 7.90% annual effective yield, grow Suburban's 7.50% savings certificate for fun and profit at any Suburban Savings Office in northern New Jersey.
In uh, Principles of Mental Physiology, Carpenter wrote, The method of producing this state consists in the maintenance of a fixed gaze on a bright object placed somewhat above the line of sight. A light behind the subject shining on the bright object, a coin, a jewel, a small mirror, is very helpful. And a darkened room. Once the subject is in the trance, he or she is open to post-hypnotic suggestion. Luckily for our peace of mind and their father's health, Marge is a subject and not the bloodthirsty Mark. Ever since I can remember, I've hated my father and feared him. But never more so than these last two years since he killed my mother. I'd like to kill him, but I haven't the guts. Well, what, Mark? Huh? Well, what do you what do you mean, what? What do you want me to ask Marge to do? <laughs> Don't tell me I'd put you into a trance, too. No, no, I... Look, what, uh... What sort of thing can I ask? Anything within reason. I mean, she won't do anything to hurt herself, or to hurt someone else, or steal, or anything that goes against her natural instincts. Uh, let's keep it simple. You know what you ought to ask her to do? What? Marry you. She's got a chance to shake this scene and have some kind of decent life of her own and get away from that monster upstairs and and she won't take it. She loves her father. That murdering... Hey, come on, take it easy, well, Mark. killed my mother. It was a car accident. He was going 90 and he was drunk when they crashed. It's a miracle anyone came out of it alive. It's a pity it had to be him. He got off lucky. Lucky? A shattered pelvis? Condemned to drag himself around on canes for the rest of his life? I hope he never knows a moment when he's not in pain. Hey, Mark. Come on, let's knock it off. I want to bring Marge out of the trance. Well, wait a minute. We've got a bet going here. You claimed you could uh, prove post-hypnotic suggestion, didn't you? Yeah. Well, suppose you... Damn, that grandfather clock... Drives me crazy. Old man's pride and joy hasn't missed a chime since the day he was born. Did it wake March? No, no. She'll stay under till I bring her out of it. What were you going to say before? Well, suppose you... Were to tell Marge to hit up the old man for five thousand dollars tomorrow at breakfast, would she do it? Well, she might if if she thought it was justified. Well, tell her tell her I needed to pay off some debts. Do you? What's the difference? She won't get it. No, Mark, I'm sorry. No, no go. Now, if you want Marge to try to get money for you, you ask her directly. When she's fully conscious. Like I figured the two of you are just putting me on. Oh no. No, I'll prove that to you. Marge? Marge? Yes? I want you to do something for me tomorrow morning. All right. What time's breakfast? Nine on the dot. Another of the old man's fetishes. Okay. Now, Marge, I want you to come down and be at the breakfast table at two minutes to nine tomorrow morning. Then, when the clock strikes nine, on the last chime, no matter what's going on, you will say, Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck nine, and I feel fine. Hickory dickory dock. And you won't remember you said it. Will you do that? Yes. I won't forget. No. Now, you've been having a nice rest. But it's time to wake up and feel refreshed and relaxed. You will wake up when I say now. Now. Mm. Mm. I feel as if I... What are you staring at? The two of you. Jeff, did it work? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you really put me under? For about ten minutes. Oh, that's scary. You know, why, if you can make me draw a blank like that, you can make me do anything. Oh, no, don't worry. I couldn't make you do anything you didn't really want to. I should hope not. Where did you learn this handy little parlor trick? <laughs> well, I once took uh, some courses in parapsychology. Do you feel relaxed, Marge? Hmm. Is your headache gone? I have to admit I do. And no headache. I really feel as if I'd had a, a whole night's sleep. You're a master magician. No, anyone can do what I did, provided he has the right subject hmm. and that person is willing. Not that I'd advise it, though. It's, it's a dangerous thing to fool around with. But, uh... 
Your friend uses it in his practice. Dr. Frank? Oh, yeah. Occasionally, if it's indicated. Actually, he's relatively conservative for a psychiatrist. I don't need him. Well, honey, I'd like to see you get rid of those headaches. I'm not a candidate for the couch yet. Well, I guess I'll hit the sack. Mm. Thanks for the fun and games. Good night. Night, little brother. Good night, Mark. Little brother? Hmm. Didn't you ever know? I was the first twin to arrive. <laughs> it's only one of Mark's resentments. He's the one who really needs analysis. Marge, Mark's problems are his own. Yours is something I want to see solved. I, I don't know why you waste your time with me. If I had any sense in this mixed-up noodle of mine, I'd, I'd marry you, have four children, and live happily ever after. But I, I just can't. Because you feel yourself tied to your father. I can't leave him alone, Jeff. I love him. I think, for your sake, Jeff, you'd, you'd better forget me. Will you do me one favor first? Will you just go to see Dr. Frank for a few visits? You think I'm that bad off? Well, Marge, you've, you've been a... You've been pretty mixed up ever since the accident. I know. Okay, Jeff. Maybe you're right. Let me think about it, and maybe I'll call your Dr. Frank tomorrow. Tomorrow? What is it, Jeff? Uh, nothing. It, it, it isn't important. It, it'd be more complicated to undo than to do now. I'll, I'll call you then and explain. Morning, Mark. Morning, Dad. You're surprisingly early. Yeah, I, um... Uh, I wanted to ask you something. If it's money, no. Dad, I'm in... bad trouble. Well, then dig yourself out. Dad. Mom left me money that will come to me when I'm 30. Why can't and I... very wise of her. Maybe in another six years, you'll be able to handle it instead of gambling it away. It wasn't Mom's decision. You talked her into it. I most certainly did. Look, you don't understand. I'm... I'm mixed up with some very hard guys. If I don't pay them all... Oh, these... don't talk nonsense. They'll wait for their money. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, Dad. Mark, am I late? No, dear. It's just two minutes to nine. Sit down. Have your orange juice. I'll pour the coffee first. You sound very chipper. Yes. I had a wonderful sleep last night. Relaxed as a kitten. I wish I could say the same. Well, that's what comes of having a guilty conscience. And what about yours? I wanted to shout at him as I pushed my chair from the table violently and went to the sideboard. I was seething with hate at his smug self-righteousness. Guilty conscience. If he only knew how guilty... How much I wanted him dead. Serving breakfast plates for Marge and me gave me time to regain control. Then the clock began to strike nine. And my mood improved. A small revenge, but if Jeff's trick worked, at least I'd see the pompous old ass look foolish for once. What time did Jeff Henderson leave last night? I think I'm old enough not to have to answer questions like that. Well, I think I have the right to ask any questions I want to in my house. Because I want to know if you're thinking again of marrying Jeff. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck nine and I feel fine. Hickory dickory dock. What? What, 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 what did you just say, Marjorie? Me? I didn't say anything. I just asked you a perfectly reasonable question, and you replied with a silly nursery rhyme. Nursery rhyme? <laughs> Dad, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't... She doesn't know. She said it. Keep out of this, Mark. It was post-hypnotic suggestion. It was what? Hmm? Marge had one of her bad headaches, and Jeff thought he could cure it by hypnosis. And he did. But what's this about... Hypnosis? Marge, I must say I didn't think you'd be this foolish... I don't want Jeff Henderson in this house again. Dad, I'm the one the trick was played on. Where's your sense of humor? I haven't had any sense of humor since I lost your mother. No, 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 don't help me. I don't need anyone I can manage by myself. I don't expect it from my son, and I don't ask it from you, Marge. Dad, I... I'll let him go, Marge. 
He's only looking for sympathy. Why do you have to be so hard on him, Mark? Because I hate him. I always have. Mark, he's our father. I love him. Yeah, well, maybe we're not... What do they call us? Uh, Enzygotic twins, after all, huh? I mean, I guess we came from two different eggs because the only thing I want him to be is dead. I think maybe we both need psychiatrists. I'll get it, Williams. Yes? Are you Mark Prentice? Yes. Well, open up, fella. Let me in. Oh, now, you don't want to see artillery, do you? Benny? Yeah. He sent me. What do you want? Oh, boy. Benny must be going soft. He lets you into him for 15 big ones. Now, look, look. I'm going to pay him. <laughs> oh, I know you're going to pay him. But when? Like, uh, what's our account? I... I haven't got anything right now, but... Benny knows... that I come into my own money when I'm 30... You got two weeks, for Two. For all account. Otherwise, a couple of broken legs, a little treatment around the kidneys, you carry the rest of your life. And we'd still be waiting for the payment. You get the message. I'm scared. And I've never been so scared in my life. And I'm caught. They mean business. And I'll never change my father's mind. I'm going to have to kill him. But how? How? Not exactly the all-American family, the Prentices. But then, where murder is contemplated, and where in fact it may be done, you don't expect to find very normal people. Especially... Or the murder is premeditated. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Oh, somebody's been drinking my sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And it's all gone. Well, actually, I saved a little. Oh, a bear! Hiya, Goldie. What's brewing? That's Miss Goldilocks to you. Oh, come on, kid. You mean you don't remember me? The cottage, the three chairs, the porridge? <gasps> Baby bear! In the fur. Been a long time, Goldie. But bear... Bear. Just call me B.B. You drank all the sugar-free diet 7-Up, and I have to conduct another diet drink taste test today. Well, yeah, I saw the sign on the door, a professional taste tester. Huh? But how can I conduct my taste test now? Why bother? I tried those other diet drinks, too. You'll notice there's still plenty of them around. Why don't ask me? Well, okay, B.B. Tell me, why did you drink all the sugar-free diet 7-Up? I like the taste. Light, fresh, natural, sugar-free diet 7-Up is definitely unbearably delicious. Mm -hmm. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? What's for dinner? Check shop rights. Low price on first cut choice beef chuck steaks. Just 57 cents a pound. Fresh ground beef chuck. Any size package. 89 cents a pound. Shop right hamburger rolls in packages of eight. Just three for one dollar. Mohawk. Five-pound canned ham will serve a crowd for just $4.99. Save on fresh red plums, three pounds for $1. Hotel bar butter, 79 cents a pound. For every meal you serve, you'll get a lot more for a little less at ShopRite. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station, your station for Mystery Theater. Almost two weeks have passed, and Mark has not been able to take any action towards solving his problem. Marge, at least under Jeff's urging, has had several sessions with Dr. Frank. And Harvey Prentice has continued to be himself. Domineering, selfish, callous to any problems but his own. Mark? Yeah, Dad. What is it? 
Where the devil is Marjorie? I think she's with a psychiatrist. What does she need with a psychiatrist? You'll have to ask her that. Oh, not again. I trust she's not going to be late for dinner this time. Search me. Well, when she comes in, I'm in the study. Oh, by the way, I see you appear to be all in one piece. No bruises, no damage. <laughs> Did you pay off your debts? No. Well, I told you nothing would happen. I've got two days left to come up with the money. Look, Dad. No. Not from me. Do you know that I'm scared to go out of the house? Has it ever occurred to you that you should and get a job? That's the way to pay your debts off. I couldn't pay my debts off with any job I can get. Perhaps you should have thought of that before you ran them up. Oh, it's easy to hate my father. And even the fact of murdering him would not be all that hard. It's just how to do it without being found out. It never occurred to me that my sister might provide the answer. Marge! Jeff, what are you doing here? I knew you had an appointment with Dr. Frank. I have the car, so I thought I'd wait and drive you home. I don't feel like talking, Jeff. Marge, I haven't seen you in almost two weeks. You, you won't even answer my phone calls. Are you mad at me? Not exactly. Is it that silly stunt I pulled with that post-hypnotic suggestion? No, no. Well, it's it's ever since that evening. I know. It... All right, all right. Let, let's get in the car and you can drive me home. Sure. I'm so mixed up, Jeff. I... Oh, I wish you'd never suggested Dr. Frank. Oh, now, wait a minute. He's a good guy. Not for my money, he isn't. I know you meant well, but... But what? Jeff, I... Well, I'm not good for you. Mark and I are all... All screwed up somehow. The whole family, we're Jonas. Keep away from us. Marge, nothing you can say... Why won't you listen to me? I don't want to see you anymore. I can't. There's... There's nothing to explain, and I... Oh, I have such a headache. Well, maybe, maybe I ought to stay and give you another hypnotic treatment. No, no, no. Nobody else is getting inside my head anymore but me. Please, let's just make this goodbye. I don't want to see you again. Marge! Marge, wait a minute! Hey, Marge. What goes? It's nothing. Just leave me alone. Okay. Play it your way. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. I, I I didn't mean to snap. It's just the top of my head's blowing off. Mm. I'm not going near that psychiatrist again. Oh, it's the panic. The things he keeps saying. I think he's the crazy one. How come? Well, I'm not going to go through all the double talk about the id and the super ego and the ego, but what he finally got around to saying was that I was jealous of Mother. And because Dad put her first, I... I hated him and wanted him dead. Well, he's got the wrong twin. But how could he say such a thing to me when I, I literally gave up Jeff to take care of Dad? Search me. I mean, honestly, I thought an Oedipus complex was strictly from the ancient Greeks and for doctors talking to each other. Can you imagine me supposed to hate my father? How could you hate Dad when you dropped everything to take care of him ever since Mom died? See, that's... That's because I'm supposed to have a fixation. And it's only guilt that holds me back from destroying him. What? He says that, that deep down in my subconscious or whatever, I, I, I really want to commit murder. You sure you know what you're saying? I know what Dr. Frank said. That I'll never get rid of my headaches till I get rid of my guilt feelings. Mm. And to get rid of those, I'll have to kill him. Dad? That's right. Well, there's a quicker way to get rid of headaches than that. How? Well, get old uh, Jeff back to hypnotize you again. No. Jeff and I are through. I, I told him that tonight. Well, if uh, you really want to get rid of a headache, well, I could have a shot at the uh, hypnosis route. Uh, Jeff said anyone could do it. No, no thanks. I'm taking my headache to bed. I won't be down for dinner. Of course, I didn't have the idea right then. 
But some instinct was nudging me that somewhere, somehow, there was a way out for me. But before I could follow the thought through, the phone rang. Yeah, hello? Hello, Mark. Look, I'm working on it. I think I've got a way to... to, to... Man says you got the day after tomorrow. And then you have time. Well, maybe I, I could raise the... the... You better raise it off, though. Because that's why Uncle Benny's calling it in. Or... Or the deep six. Hey, mister. Mister. <sighs> Who's on the phone, Mark? <sighs> Someone... For me, Dad. Did I hear your sister come in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a few minutes ago. Well, did you tell her I wanted to see her in the study? No. Damn it, face me when I talk. Why not? Because she didn't want to see you. She wasn't feeling well. She went up to bed. Before dinner? She said she didn't feel like eating. And neither do I. Well, what's the matter with you? I'm scared, Dad. That's what's the matter. I'm scared so bad I'm sick. Why? That was some hard guy on the phone. Benny's man. Who's Benny? The man I owe money to. Look, you've got to let me have it. No. You don't understand. If I don't come up with it the day after tomorrow, they could kill me. Don't be ridiculous. All I'm asking is to give me my part of the money that Mom left. Marge got hers. Marjorie could be trusted. You cannot. Please. I'm not your mother, Mark. You haven't got her around to bail you out anymore the way she used to. This time it's your problem and no one else's. The only way you'll ever get any money out of me beyond living expenses is over my dead body. The only way I ever wanted it from him. Over his dead body. And suddenly, at last, I could see the way to do it. Dinner was eaten in stony silence. Just the two of us. After it, my father went back to the study for coffee and brandy. I sneaked upstairs to my father's bedroom, which had been my mother's, too, and searched quickly through her drawers to find what I wanted. The rest was waiting till my father was safely in bed for the night. And then moving quietly along the upstairs corridor to my sister's room. Who is it? Uh, Mark. May I come in? I suppose so. I knew you were up. I saw the light under the door. Dad came by to say goodnight an hour or so ago. I couldn't get back to sleep. What time is it? The witching hour. Midnight. Uh, mind if I sit on the other bed for a moment? It's all right. My bed light in your eyes? No, 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 no. It's just fine. How's the headache? Oh, splitting. <laughs> I wish I had some magic remedy. I just like to go to sleep tonight and never wake up again. No, you don't mean that. I do tonight. What's that swinging in your hand? <laughs> That's a memento from better days. Remember, it's the, uh, it's, uh, Mom's tick-tock watch. Oh, I haven't seen that in years. It's still so shiny. Where'd you get it? Oh, well, I've had it a while. Remember how when we were kids, she used to put us to sleep with it? <laughs> the tick-tock watch. Tick-tock, tick-tock, back and mm. forth. <laughs> My eyes used to get glued to it. Mm. tick Tick-tock, tick-tock, back and forth, back and forth, till I began to get so sleepy, so sleepy. So sleepy. Mm -hmm. Sleep, Marge. Sleep. Keep your eyes on the watch. Yeah, your eyelids are getting heavy. Heavy. So Heavy. You've got to sleep. 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 Marge. Marge. 
I can't believe it. She can't feel the flame. Marge, you're asleep. But you can hear me. Yes, I hear you. Who am I? You're Mark. Am I your brother? Yes. Your twin? Yes. Do you know our father? Yes. How do I feel about him? You... hate him. How do you feel about him? Marge, I asked you. How do you feel about him? I... I hate him, too. Would you like to kill him? Yes. I've always wanted to. I want to kill him. I could hardly believe my luck. And just in time to save my neck. The perfect weapon for the perfect murder. My sister. But did I dare to use it? To hurt her instead of being hurt myself? What would they do to her? What would happen to her if I did what I was planning? And would it even work? What were the odds on the biggest gamble I would ever take in my life? A girl helpless under an hypnotic spell, at the mercy of the agent who wove that spell, her twin brother, himself at the mercy of passions beyond his control, eaten up with hate, tortured by fear, hesitating to make an unconscionable gamble with her life to save his own. I'll return shortly with Act Three. I'd like to describe a car to you. See what you think of it. First of all, it's small. Second, it's got a six-cylinder engine, a pretty handy asset these days. Third, it's a Buick. Now, in spite of the fact that it's small, this car can seat six easily. It's got a 21-gallon fuel tank, which gives it great range. And it weighs several hundred pounds more than most imports, which in a small car is good. Now, what does it look like? Well, that's pretty tough to handle on radio. I'd hesitate to call it glamorous, and it sure isn't homely. I think handsome would be fair, and it offers some pretty attractive styling and trim options. The interior is definitely its strong suit. Now, if that sounds like a little more than your average small car, then I've described it properly. Because remember, this small car is a Buick. The car is called Apollo, Buick Apollo, and it's about as much small car as you'll find on the road today. See for yourself at your Buick Opal dealer. One of the ten best newspapers in America. Easily the nation's best suburban newspaper. Becoming a paper of national influence. These words are from a recent issue of Time magazine. The newspaper described is Newsday, the Long Island newspaper. On the basis of editorial excellence, Time magazine selected the ten newspapers in America that stand out above the rest. One of them was Newsday. Because, as Time noted, Newsday combines solid local coverage with ambitious national and international undertakings. And because Newsday meets Time's other criteria for excellence, it's entertaining and informative. It conducts extended investigations and offers a range of different opinions in its editorial pages. Have Newsday delivered right to your door with no service charge and see why it's one of the ten best papers in America. Newsday. Long Island's own newspaper. Marge lies still, her eyes wide open, but unseeing. Alongside, her brother Mark sits, his mother's watch still swinging its pendulum arc in his hand, unnoticed as he wrestles with the conscience which holds him back from this ultimate gamble. The gamble? Can anyone under hypnotic influence be induced to commit murder? If she killed, they'd never do anything to her. There's a whole history. The encephalitis she had as a kid, the nervous breakdown after Mom died, 
She's going to a psychiatrist now. Sure, I can get her off. Temporary insanity. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Only will it work. What was it Jeff said? She won't do anything to hurt herself. Or to hurt someone else. Or steal. Or do anything that goes against her natural instincts. Natural instincts. What does that mean? Doesn't it mean what we really feel deep inside, even if we don't know about it? It's a gamble. But the odds aren't bad. It's Mark, Marge. Can you hear me? I hear you. Remember a couple of weeks ago when Jeff was here and we got off on the hypnosis kick? Yes, I remember. And what started it? I don't know. I think, yes, talking about being kids. Remember how even then Jeff was into the uh, psychic bit? Yes, the funny cards and guessing <laughs> and trying to reach each other's minds. And who was the best? We were. Why? Because we're twins. Twins go together. Remember how we always liked the same things? Mm. Mocha ice cream and rare hamburger buttermilk, crazy things nobody else liked. We liked, just like we hated. What did we hate? You know, coffee, half and half, uh, <laughs> hot dogs without relish, mm. people who lie or cheat or murder. Murder? Like Dad. He killed Mother, didn't he? There was, there was an accident. He was too drunk to drive the car. Didn't you hate him after the accident? I don't know. Don't you hate him now? I... Yes, I hate him. Would you like to see him dead? Would I? I would. And we're twins, remember? Yes, twins. We always think alike, right? We always think alike. I want to kill him. Don't you? I want to kill him. Then listen. Tomorrow night he'll go to bed early. He'll be fast asleep by 10 o'clock, you understand? Fast asleep by 10 o'clock. I can promise you that. I won't be here. But when the grandfather clock strikes 10, you're going to go to the dining room, right? When it strikes 10, I go to the dining room. In the sideboard drawer. You know which one. His dad's carving knife. The one he keeps honed to a razor's edge with the sharp points, remember? I remember. The carving knife. Right. And then go to his bedroom and plunge it into his chest. Um... Listen to me, Marge. You'll be doing what you always wanted to do. Um... You'll never have headaches anymore because the guilt will be gone. Um... You'll be destroying him just as you've always wanted to do. Killing what you hate, um... what I hate. Killing all the hate in our hearts. You understand? When the clock strikes ten tomorrow night, I am to get the carving knife and take it upstairs and plunge it into Dad until he is dead. And when you wake up in the morning, you won't remember any of this. I didn't sleep much that night, and next day was an endless nightmare. By the time dinner was over, I was a wreck. But the real strain was just beginning. No, it was no sweat to slip the barbiturate in Dad's coffee and later to help him up to bed half comatose and get him settled snoring for the night. It was after the clock chimed 8.30 that I finally left the house to establish my own alibi. Stopping carefully, I might add, on the way out to make sure the uh, clock was wound, although my father was usually infallible in seeing that it never ran down. And then I left the house. <laughs> Hey, Mark. I'm sorry I'm a little late. Oh, just glad you're here. Have you eaten? Oh, yeah. You? Oh, long time ago. I, I, uh, I ordered some setups. Uh, scotch okay with you? Uh, one drink. Just thought we might, uh, have a talk together. What time is it? Uh, around five or so to nine. Well, what'd you want to talk about? Uh, March. <laughs> well, that's my favorite subject. You aren't the bearer of good news by any chance. Good news? Well, that she's changed her mind about me and I might have some kind of a chance with her. Oh, that's something we might discuss, Jeff. Let's, uh, let's have another drink first. Well, 
was I? Don't you think you should go a little easy on the drinking, Mark? Hey, if I want to get drunk, I'll get drunk. Not with me, Buster. All right, okay, so I'm sober. Where was I? Well, you were trying to explain something about your sister, which is the only reason you're holding me. Oh, oh yeah, Marge, yeah. You know, you don't stand a, a chance as long as Dad's around. Yeah, I'm aware of that problem. Well, su supposing it suddenly didn't exist anymore, supposing there wasn't my father. Well, <laughs> that's your only question for the evening. Maybe we ought to order another drink. Mark. Mark. Huh? Come what? on. What? Come on, I paid up. Let's get out of here. No, 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 I can't. What, what, what time? What time is it? It's after 10 o'clock. How much? <laughs> it's five, ten minutes after 10. That's not long enough. I got to stay here a while. Okay, suit yourself. I'm going home. Hey, we haven't finished talking. As far as I'm concerned, we have. I, I want to... I want to tell you about Marge. Look, whatever you had to tell me about Marge, if you ever had, it's too late for you to make any sense tonight. Either you come with me now and I'll drop you home, or stay, get as stoned as you want. I've got to stay just a little longer. Doesn't matter anymore. My hands, my feet, everything seemed like lead from the moment 10 o'clock had passed. Before, I had been fired up, nervously tensed, hard put to act normal. Now the drinks meant nothing. I, I wanted to call it all back. I stumbled to my feet. I rushed out of the bar. In the cab, back to the house, I had all sorts of fantasies. Sometimes when the clock got overwound, it would stop. If it hadn't struck ten, maybe my father was still alive. And the other fear... How did I expect my amateur hypnosis would work? In the house, empty. I was conscious of the echo of its size for the first time. Through the hall, up the big staircase, down the hall to my father's room. Everything seemed to echo. Carefully, I opened the door to my father's room and listened. No sound. I went in. I looked at my father where he lay, lit by a lamp on the far wall over the dressing table. The first thing I was conscious of was that he was breathing. And I saw the carving knife on the floor. It was instinctive to pick it up. It was bright silver and stainless steel, glittering in the corner lamp. There was no trace of blood. He wasn't dead. And I knew I would have to do this by myself. By myself. There never had been any other way. So I came to the bed, lifting the knife up high to drive it home. And suddenly his eyes were open looking at me, recognizing what was about to happen. And one convulsive shrug towards me, his eyes glazed over. But in that last moment, he said, You always wanted me dead. Dead. So, st strike. Strike. For all the good it will do you. So he's dead, as you wanted him to be. I don't have to listen to you. Oh, yes, you'd better listen to me. What you tried to do to your sister is beyond belief. She hated my father as much as I did. Your thumbnail psychology is about as successful as what you know about hypnotism. Oh, you put Marge to the acid test. And your hypnotic suggestion worked just as you planned it, up till the last moment. How do you know? Because your sister ran to me for help. At the last moment, she couldn't force herself to turn against love. Not for this one man. Or me, or you. But just the fact that she was human and normal. And hate was no part of her. But love was. So she dropped the knife and ran to you. Well, you dropped it too, didn't you? When it came to the test, you could no more strike than Marge. Could you? I'll never know. He died before I had the chance. 
A massive stroke had caused my father's death before I had a chance to kill him. But if I wasn't guilty in fact, I certainly was in intention. And to achieve his death, I would have tried anything within my power. I was lucky to get off scot-free, I thought. And I direct that my entire estate be left to my beloved daughter Marjorie, subject to all the provisions to protect it and her from my son Mark, to whom, with all my heart, I leave nothing. Not one cent. As attorney for the estate, Mark, I'm going to make sure your father gets his wish. Oh, sure, big deal. You figure to marry the heiress. I figure to protect Marge from you as long as I live. If I thought I could wring your neck by myself and get away with it, I'd be happy to do it. Luckily, I don't have to worry. No dough, brother. Not a penny. Go pay your debts. Can one be hypnotized and led to kill? Certainly not from tonight's story. And highly doubtful, if not impossible, no matter who the subject might be. But just in case, I hope we have all learned that it is nothing to meddle with for the uninformed. Like all special areas in life, it should be used by the expert, only in cases of special need. It was some time before Marge and Jeff were married. But once they were, the shadows and cobwebs were wiped away. Mark was only a dark memory that would disintegrate in time as thoroughly as his corporal self, trapped in his cement boots in the shifting muck of the river bottom where he lies. Who sows the wind must reap the whirlwind. Our cast included Marcia Rod, Nick Pryor, Ira Lewis, and Stotts Cotsworth. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. U.S. District Court Judge John Sarika today delayed proceedings on a White House motion to quash a special prosecutor subpoena for more presidential tapes, in the judge's words, for the purpose of facilitating discussions leading to a possible compliance. Judge Sarika's brief announcement came after special White House counsel James St. Clair entered the judge's chambers, saying that he would ask for a delay in hopes of working out such a compromise. The judge postponed until Friday of this week the deadline for the special prosecutor's office to answer a motion from White House lawyer James St. Clair to quash a subpoena for 64 presidential conversations. St. Clair, you recall, went into court last week with a motion to stop the subpoena, and Judge Sirica originally had set today as the deadline for the prosecutor's response. The judge also delayed a hearing on St. Clair's motion originally scheduled for Wednesday until a week from today, next Monday. Before entering a conference with the other lawyers and Judge Sirica, Attorney St. Clair said that he had asked for a five-day delay to permit the special prosecutor and myself to see whether we can come to some accommodation. In filing his motion last week to quash the subpoena, St. Clair had indicated that the dispute over release of the tapes to the prosecutor might be carried all the way to the Supreme Court. In that filing, 
That was a formal claim of privilege signed personally by President Nixon, declaring that the conversations that were being sought are confidential conversations, quote, between a president and his close advisors, and it would be inconsistent with the public interest to produce those tapes. About 20 of the conversations in question, the, question, the conversations that have been demanded by Leon Jaworski, the special prosecutor, were among the talks for which the White House released transcripts last week. For those, the president said no claim of privilege was asserted. The Jaworski subpoenas were for conversations that started on June 20th of 1972. They span a period of time that finally ended on June 4th of 1973. The earliest date is just three days after the famous Watergate break-in at the Democratic Party National Headquarters. That was June 17th of 1972. The June 4th date is the day on which President Nixon listened to some of the Watergate tape recordings. The counsel of the president, J. Fred Buzzhart, testified before one of the Watergate grand juries today, but he refused to tell what that questioning was all about. He appeared before Watergate grand jury number three, which is investigating, among other things, the 18 and a half minute gap in one of the key White House tapes. In his White House role, attorney Buzzhart had overall custody of the tapes at one point last year, and he testified extensively during a court hearing into the causes of the now famous 18 and a half minute gap and about two other tape recordings that the White House said never existed. There have been some reports in recent weeks that Buzz Hart still had a major say in just what recordings the president would yield to the special Watergate prosecutor and to the House Judiciary Committee, even though James St. Clair, of course, is now said to handle all Watergate legal matters for the president. The White House indicated today that the president's Watergate counsel, St. Clair, may not fight against the granting of immunity for administration witnesses that are called before the House Judiciary Committee. Press Secretary Ronald Siegler told reporters at a briefing that St. Clair told him earlier today that there appeared to be no problem in granting of immunity. Siegler added that the White House does not have a fixed position on that subject. He noted that it would be up to the committee to determine the question of immunity for witnesses who could tell what they know about Watergate-related matters. Michigan Republican Representative Edward Hutchinson, the ranking minority member of the Judiciary Panel, has already been quoted as saying that he would oppose granting immunity to any witnesses who testify before his committee during its impeachment inquiry. Asked if there has been any effect on the White House staff since the president released the transcripts of a number of White House conversations last week, Ziegler today replied, over the past month, there has been a hesitancy to make extensive notes or to put anything down on paper. Ziegler said the problem had not yet reached serious proportions, but he said it might if there were a breakdown in the principle of executive privilege. The president issued the transcripts in response to the Judiciary Committee's formal subpoena for the tapes of 42 presidential conversations. Herbert Kalmbach has testified of a midnight meeting in which he said a top dairy cooperative official was told that milk prices would be increased and that the White House wanted confirmation of a $2 million campaign pledge Kalmbach, of course, is a former campaign fundraiser for President Nixon. He has said in secret testimony that the session took place on March 24th, 1971, in his suite at the Madison Hotel here in Washington. Milk price supports were increased just the following day. The White House has said that the president's milk price order was not in any way influenced by the promise of campaign contributions from the dairy cooperative. The alleged meeting, which took place after a Republican fundraising dinner attended by dozens of dairy cooperative officials, included Kalmbach, Marie Chotner, and Harold Nelson, or at least so goes the Kalmbach testimony. Chotner had quit three weeks earlier as the president's special counsel and had just entered private law practice where he was receiving a retainer of $57,000 a year paid by the nation's largest dairy cooperative, the Associated Milk Producers Incorporated, Nelson was the chief executive officer of that cooperative. According to the testimony, Kalmbach swore that Chotner told Nelson that John Ehrlichman, who was the president's chief domestic advisor at that time, wanted Nelson to reaffirm the milk producer's promise of $2 million in light of a milk, uh, milk price increase that the president had just directed. Kalmbach said that Nelson agreed. The next day, the administration made its public announcement of the price increase of 27 cents per hundred weight, 
which added hundreds of millions of dollars to the income of dairy farmers around the nation. Comrack's testimony was given about six weeks ago to two investigators for the Senate Watergate Committee, Alan Weitz and David Dorson. They said that this testimony, along with other unspecified evidence, provides the basis for a letter which lawyers for the House Judiciary Committee sent to the White House back on April 19th. That letter intended to state facts showing the impeachment investigators' need for 45 presidential tape recordings about the Milk Fund affair was made public just last Friday. It said, among other things, that on March 24, 1971, quote, Mr. Murray Chotner stated to several dairy men that Mr. Ehrlichman expected the dairy industry to reaffirm its $2 million commitment in light of a forthcoming increase in milk price supports. The White House has rebutted by saying that the president was aware of the dairyman's $2 million promise because his aide, Charles Colson, had told him about it back in 1970. Colson has been identified as the main contact in the White House for Nelson and, indeed, for other dairy cooperative officials. The White House, though, has vigorously denied that the president's decision to raise prices was in any way influenced by that promise of money. He was influenced, the White House has declared, by traditional political considerations, including pressure from Democrats on Capitol Hill, Democrats who themselves wanted a price increase. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko have arranged to meet tomorrow on the island of Cyprus, the purpose to discuss their search for an end to the Middle East war insofar as the current hostilities on the Israeli-Syrian front are concerned. Plans for that meeting were announced in Moscow and by...